morning. Welcome to a new day in our family of faith here at West Hills Baptist Church. It is a beautiful fall day outside. I got my fall colors on, one very special one. And I'm just so delighted that we can connect in this way. This has really been a blessing for us during this time. And I know that uh, all of you join with me in our prayers to safely get on the other side of things. And I think the sermon that I have this morning is, it really speaks to that. And I hope it is a blessing to you. Before I get started, I want to make sure that you read the Old Testament passage that we that we have for this morning. This was not the call of Abram, but this is where Abraham later on, after he has has gone to follow God, and he, he starts getting frustrated, and he's asking God for the blessings. Where are these blessings? You know, he's, he's waited all this time, and, and it's described as the covenant of, of Abraham with God, and, and something happened there. There was something happening in the waiting, and we're going to talk about that, so make sure you have read that before you watch the rest of this. But now I'm going to read our New Testament passage, which is a very familiar one. This is many times called the love chapter. It's described as the gift of love. This is the 13th chapter of First Corinthians, and I think it very much speaks to where we find ourselves today. Hear this as if you're hearing it for the first time. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Man, we need to hear that today. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? God above us, God before us, God within us, be now between us a bridge across which your truth can pass in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit we pray amen one of the comedians i miss the most is rodney dangerfield you just don't hear his kind of self-deprecating humor much these days here's one i remember he said growing up in my neighborhood when i was a teenager was like this we played spin the bottle and the girls would spin the bottle And if the bottle landed on you, you either got a kiss or a nickel. He said, by the time I was 14, I owned my own home. (laughs) Now that is what I would describe as persistence. Most of you know that I taught high school sociology for seven years. And one of the questions I remember asking when we were studying different groups around the world, I would ask this question, tell me what all Jews all Christians and all Muslims have in common. In seven years, I I never got an answer other than that they were all religious. That's about all my students could come up with. There are two basic answers to that question. What do Jews, Christians, and Muslims have in common? One is that they, they are the religions that embraced monotheism, one God. And you know from studying Greek mythology in school 
that most ancient religions had many gods. So that's one answer. But more importantly, all Jews, all Christians, and all Muslims trace their ancestry through Abraham. What was it about this person of Abraham? All people have, all Jews, all Christians, all Muslims have him in common. What was it about him that caused so many people to be drawn to God? Now, the Old Testament story that we read this morning is not the beginning of Abraham's story. We are first told about his genealogy. Genealogy has always been important to people, but particularly to, particularly so with the ancient Jews. Then Abraham is approached by and was asked to partner with him. God approaches him because God wanted to bless him and all of his descendants. So that God simply tells him he wants to give him great blessing. But in order for that to happen, God asked Abraham to leave behind all that was familiar to him. And this is when he was 75 years old. Can you imagine being 75 and God asking you to leave everything besides your wife behind? But in one small verse in chapter 12, it simply says this phrase, and Abraham went. We tend to read right past it, and Abraham went. And this is where the journey and the blessings began. God wanted to partner with him and to bless him, but in order for that to happen, he had to change almost everything. Change. How does that word strike us? It reminds me of the first little church I pastored down in the south of Atlanta, the Shadner First Baptist Church in Union City, Georgia. It was made up mostly of older folks, and I remember one time after church, Kim was laughing because this woman came up to her uh, after the service and said in that deep Georgia accent, Honey, I'm 85 years old. Your husband keeps preaching about change all the time. I'm 85. I'm not changing nothing. <laughs> no matter where we are in life, God is not through with us. And this story is reflective of that. Let me ask you a question this morning. What did Abraham do to, to, to deserve such incredible blessing. We're not told. All we know is that he left everything that he was comfortable with and everything that he knew, he left it behind to follow God. And I can imagine him asking that question, why me, wouldn't you? Why me? And he probably said something like this, I don't know why, but I'm going to trust this God who wants to bless me. Now we get to the passage that we did read this morning. We're not sure how many years have passed at this point, but Abraham, in effect, says, you remember those blessings you promised? I'm still waiting on those blessings you talked about. Now, isn't it interesting that we would study that at a time like we find ourselves in today? It seems like the world has turned upside down. We've had to walk away from so many things that we used to do. We know God wants to bless us, and we trust that he will. In the meantime, we want to know how long we are going to have to wait. Abraham was frustrated at what he had not gotten yet. He was probably watching his wife grow older, realizing that the chances of her bearing a child were getting slimmer day by day. He was afraid of not having an heir. So he's showing his frustration. Lord, you told me about my descendants. You told me about all this land I was going to have. Where is it? Where is it? And interestingly, God says to him, get up and go outside and look up into the night sky. God said to him, count the stars if you're able to count them. So shall your descendants be. And I think it was a pivotal moment for Abraham. I think Abraham looked up into the sky and considered the great mystery of God and came to the conclusion that he was not always going to get the answers that he wanted. And he realized the mistakes he had made 
when he began to follow God. Think back on the series of, of events that took place after Abraham left his home. The first thing that happened was there was a famine. Can you imagine that? I'm going to bless you like no one ever before, and the first thing that happens is a famine. So Abraham goes down to Egypt and makes all kinds of mistakes. And in effect, God has to go get him and lead him back on the right path. And then we see this frustration on Abraham's part. God, where are the blessings? Where are the promises? But he looks up into the sky and something happened within him. And I think he trusted God again. Several years ago, Kim and I got to go scuba diving in Little Cayman Island. This was back in the days when you had to call on the phone to cash in your frequent flyer miles, right? And you know how difficult that can be to do sometimes. I would ask about a destination and the lady would tell me, well, there's only one and a half seats available on that plane, you know, something like that. To make a long story short, I said to the lady, ma'am, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I have miles and I'm flexible. Tell me where in the Caribbean we can go. And I sat there on the phone for like 10 minutes and I could hear her typing, typing. Finally, she says, how about the Cayman Islands? I said, deal. So we used our frequent flyer miles to get to Grand Cayman. And then we got a little puddle jumper over to Little Cayman, having no idea what we were getting into. And I'll never forget as we were landed, Kim was sitting next to the window and she goes, are we on grass? I was like, what? <laughs> we were on grass. I got out of the plane and the airport was also the post office, the fire station, and the Jeep rental. <laughs> we had no idea what we were getting into. The scuba diving was phenomenal. But what we did not expect that was what was above the water was going to be as beautiful. And not the island itself. The Caymans are flat. But it was the first time we had ever gone someplace with zero light pollution. So the first night after dinner and the sun went down, we took a couple plastic chairs down to the beach and it was a new moon, meaning there was no moon in the sky and the stars were just stunning. But it was more than just the stars that we could see. Being several hundred miles away from home, the stars looked completely different and we were just fascinated by it. Now I am no astronomer. I can pick out the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. That's about it. Some of you are probably like me. That's about the best I can do. But just being in that different place and looking up and seeing all those stars from a different perspective was just fascinating. So I thought on that first night, I wondered if I would still be fascinated on the next night. And we were. Each night, we so looked forward to taking those plastic chairs down to the beach and we would just stargaze at God's creation. It was a sense of having our spirits renewed. That sense of wonder that we see in children that we tend to lose as adults, it's still within us. And if we choose to be open to it, we can still have that childlike response to the great mystery of God. Abraham was willing to go, and then God asked him to endure through some tough times, hard times. I'm here to tell you this morning that God asked the same thing of us. And just like Abraham blew it from time to time, we do too. But he still recognized that this was a God of great mystery and a God of great abundance who was going to provide and was going to bless. So I believe on that night, Abraham's spirit was renewed. And he trusted God again. And so can we. We worship a God who wants to bless us. This morning, I want, you, I want to remind you that we don't just reach out to God. God reaches out to us. That would have been completely foreign to the ancients. And I'm afraid that some people today are feeling the same kind of thing. This 
story is the beginning of God's journey. We have to remind ourselves that that story ends with a risen Christ. I remember one time in the seminary, I heard my professor say something that caused me to do a lot of thinking. He said, God's ways of spelling good and evil are not our ways. I had to think about that. I didn't know if I agreed with that fully, but it definitely caused me to consider it for a long time. At the bottom of those thoughts was that I was sure that I didn't have it all figured out. But when I look back on my life at the times when I let things get to me, I realized that God had been there all along. It caused me to consider how I could have handled it differently if I had known that everything was going to be okay. Now I realize I could have leaned on God more and not only more fully understand what I did know, but to more fully accept what I did not know. This morning, I want you to think about your high school history classes. It is so easy as a history teacher to simply teach from war to war to war. Think about it, especially if you're on the semester system, you only had one semester. So you have the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, each are critical to know about. But we know there is more than war. Let me give you an example. I always thought that the curriculum was so clever to always include the story of Abraham Lincoln, not just him becoming elected president, but I'll bet you know the story about Abraham's, Abraham Lincoln's unsuccessful run for the Senate in Illinois. He got defeated. I'll bet, you, I'll bet you remember reading about the famous debates he had with Stephen Douglas. The famous debates and Lincoln lost that election. Why is that so important for our history students to learn about? Because we know from the letters that Lincoln wrote later on that he looked back on those failed attempts and experiences and realizes that not only would he likely have not made it to the presidency had he won that election, but that he would not have been prepared to make the kinds of gut-wrenching decisions that he was forced to make during the Civil War. All of us have a story like that, whether we know it or not. This New Testament passage that we read this morning is a famous one. We hear it at weddings a lot. It talks about having an understanding of a child. I spoke, thought, reasoned like a child, but now I am an adult. And in effect, the Apostle Paul is telling us that God expects us to have an adult understanding. Part of that is admitting that we don't have all the answers. We only know in part, but we lean on this great God of mystery. And Paul is also telling us to trust in this God who has promised to bless us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Was the life of Jesus any different? The Bible tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. What does that mean? It means that the adult Jesus was not the same as the child Jesus. Jesus grew just like we are expected to do. Jesus begins his ministry, comes to the waters of baptism. God is overjoyed with his decision. He goes to the desert to be tempted by the devil himself. And he comes out and he goes to his own people in his own hometown to preach his first sermon. And you remember what he said. He preaches, he says, repent and believe the good news. What does that mean? Does that simply mean to feel sorry for the mistakes that you have made? Or does it more fully mean as an adult not to buy into childlike thinking anymore? To no longer be just caught up in the rules and instead focus you on your relationship with God and to become the person that he would have you to be. Get past the old ways. Embrace this God of love who wants to bless you. 
The religious establishment at the time was so upset at Christ's message of this God of love that they began to plot his death. Jesus trusted in God enough to accept people where they were, to allow them to do whatever it is that they had to do so that God could do whatever he had to do. And 2,000 years later, we come from all of our varied experiences and come together in whatever form to worship a Jewish carpenter who decided to do God's will for his life. Only a handful of you have heard me tell the story of how I became the pastor of my little church down in Atlanta. I'd only been in the, in the seminary for three semesters, and I decided to look for some interim work. You know what that is. That's when a church is between pastors and someone comes in to preach until they find one. So that's what I put on my resume, seeking interim position. So one of my professors, Dr. Gannon, informs me that he has arranged for me to interview at this little church, and he sends me off to the Shadner First Baptist Church in this little church in Union City, Georgia. And so I take Kim with me because she's much more perceptive than I am. And the interview went well. And so we get back in the car uh, after it was over and Kim says to me, I don't think they're talking interim. And I said, really? Now, where this church is located is, is important to the story. It not only was on the complete opposite side of Atlanta from where we lived, it was also in an area where there was a shooting within five miles of this little church every day every single day if i had been single i would have gone there but I, I could not in good conscience move my family there so i go through the interview process and at this point i'm only talking to two people the chairman of the pastor search committee and the chairman of the deacons and lo and behold they offer me the position to be their pastor and i said listen i've got a year and a half left in the seminary i live on the opposite side of town let me be your interim pastor, and if you still don't have anybody by the time I graduate, then we'll look at this again. And they said, no, we're looking for a pastor. And I said, I'm so sorry. I, I cannot in good conscience accept that position at this point. So the guy calls me back a couple days later, and he says, listen, our deacons are not going to accept an interim position they want a pastor how can we sell them on this and I said no problem you know I have a sales background I said tell them this and tell them this and tell them this the guy says okay let me see what I can do he calls me back the next day he says okay we've got it worked out we want you to come preach on Sunday I said great and you know how Baptists do it interims as same as senior position the preacher comes in preaches it leaves the room they call a business meeting and vote and so i go down there, I preach, Kim and I leave the room, they vote, and when I come back in, they introduce me as their new full-time pastor. <laughs> I mean, I could not have been more clear. It's absolutely not a case of misunderstanding what I was saying. I was dumbfounded. So I shook everybody's hand, and I waited till the next day when I could talk to Dr. Gannon. I wish each of you could know him. He, he is one of the wisest men on the planet, and he was so cool about it. He said, Drew, who cares if it's interim in your mind only? He said, go down there and serve those people. They know they're not going to have you forever, and let the chips fall where they may. And that's exactly what I did. It was one of the most meaningful times in my life. Now, had that not happened that way, I likely would not have gotten the interview at my church in Kentucky, at the First Baptist Church of Shepherdsville, because I would have had no experience as a senior pastor. And had I not spent those four and a half years in Kentucky, I likely would not have been in a position to come be the pastor of our church here. And now, here I am, the pastor of a healthy church that loves my family, loves my girls, they're growing up in a church that tells them that they can grow up and be anything that God wants them to be. And I look back at what I was doing when I tried to become an interim and began realizing that the first thing I tried to do was to limit 
what God had in store for me. How many little things in life has God overcome for us? The essence of our faith is holding what we know in one hand, holding what we don't know in the other hand, and holding them close to our hearts as we grow in Christ and allowing God to do his work. Our legalistic friends miss out on so much. If you favor the rules over your relationship with God, you miss out on the incredible mystery of God, that acceptance of what we don't know and what God might be able to do with us. Looking up at the vastness of the stars and realizing that God wants us to be a part of that. Let me ask you a question this morning. Which is more important? What we know or what we don't know? May I suggest this morning that they are equally important in living out our relationship with God. David Orr is a professor and an author. He talks about different ways of living. And when I read this, it reminded me so much of when I was teaching school and just how much I was pushing achievement with my kids. Listen to what this man says. He says, the plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, more healers, more restorers, more storytellers, and lovers of every kind. Has that truth ever been more important than where we find ourselves in 2020? The planet needs people that live in their places and loves in their places. That is what Abraham did. And that is what God is calling us to do. He is calling us to be persistent in our patience, persistent in our kindness, and not be envious or boastful or rude. Jesus is asking us to bear all things recognizing that we only know in part, holding what we know and what we don't know close to our heart while we partner with God. That can get us through anything, and that can change everything. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy. The only wise God, our Father, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Go in peace.